Greetings. I'm David Wessel, Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. I want to welcome you to the annual Municipal Finance Conference, the 11th one. As you know, our purpose here is to bring together academics, practitioners, and public sector officials to discuss recent research on municipal capital markets and on state and local fiscal issues more generally. This conference is a joint venture of the Hutchins Center at Brookings, the, Roosevelt, the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance at the Brandeis International Business School, the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis, and the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Um, um, I welcome you on behalf of my colleague, Louise Shainer at Brookings, Rich Reifel at WashU, Dan Bergstresser at Brandeis, and um, uh, Justin Marlowe at the University of Chicago. So here's our plan for today. We have two papers, uh, both on state and local aspects of the COVID crisis, followed by a panel discussion with a number of people who I'll introduce later on various, on the broader questions of how state and local governments handle the COVID crisis and what's happened since uh, the, with all the federal money that went their way. We then have a break uh, for about 10 minutes and we have a couple of papers to be discussed. And then finally, at 1.45, we have two breakout sessions, one on what's going on in the state and local sector more generally, and the other what's happening in the uni bond market. Um, to join those uh, sessions, which will be very informal, you'll need to go to Zoom. And on the event page for this uh, webinar that you're watching, there's a link there. And we'll remind you of that later in the program. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an opportunity to hear from uh, viewers directly during this session. But if you have questions, there are at least three ways to pose them. One is on a website called Slido, sli.do. You just type in Muni Finance at, when you log on and uh, I'll monitor that. We also, you can put them on Twitter at hashtag Muni Finance. And finally, if you can't figure out those ways, you feel free to email me at dwessel at brookings.edu and I'll keep an eye on my email. So uh, we have two papers this morning. One is from uh, that Stan Voiger at AEI is gonna present by Jeff Clemens, uh, Phil Hoxby and Stan. Uh, Jeff and Phil are at the University of California at San Diego and it's titled, Was Pandemic Fiscal Relief Effective Fiscal Stimulus Evidence from State and Local, from Aid to State and Local Governments? Uh, Stan will present for about 15 minutes. And then following that, my colleague Louise Shainer will talk about the work she's done in the state and local sector during the pandemic. And then we'll get to any of your questions in the panel discussion that follows. So with that, Stan, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, David. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here at this, at this conference. I am going to share my screen so that everyone can see my slides. Um, and so, yes, as David, said the work I'll be presenting is joint work with Jeff Clemens and Phil Hoxie of UCSD. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon some related work that's uh, joined with uh, my uh, AI colleague, John Kearns as well. But so um, what I'm gonna talk about is the effect of pandemic fiscal relief for states and localities. Um, in particular, I am going to uh, discuss some of our findings on whether transfers from the federal government uh, during the COVID pandemic have helped preserve state and local government jobs. I'll talk a little bit about the broader macro impact of those transfers. So that's on uh, unemployment uh, overall, on output, on consumption. And then finally, I'll briefly talk about the public health impact of these, of these broad uh, transfers to state and local governments in the sense of, you know, what impact did they have on vaccination and testing efforts. Now, these are important questions, obviously. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, the federal government uh, dramatically increased its transfers to state and local government uh, by uh, close to a trillion dollars across four different bills. Um, in part, I think this is motivated by concerns that uh, during the Great Recession, state and local government employment uh, became a drag on the, on the broader macro economy. Um, but of course, that's not the, the sole purpose of, of, these, uh, of these transfers, and that's why we look at this, this broader range of potential impacts. Now, to, to first step back for a moment and give some broader context, uh, in the U.S. states and, and local governments as well face balanced budget requirements and uh, 
uh, as a consequence or perhaps as a cause, uh, the federal government is the primary source of macro stabilization policy in the US system of fiscal federalism. Um, right? The idea is that when a downturn hits, uh, in the absence of federal support, states would have to either raise taxes or cut back on, on service provision. And that doesn't seem like it would uh, be optimal policy. Now, states do some saving and rainy day funds and, and some other funds, but, but typically not enough to smooth out those shocks, uh, in part too, because they are often uh, restricted uh, legally from how much money they can put into those funds, how they can spend it, et cetera. Um, now, what does this federal role look like? The, the baseline role, so that is in the absence of additional uh, measures, there are matching funds that are generated through the, through the Medicaid program. Um, there is uh, money that flows into uh, unemployment insurance that runs through the states. And then there are more targeted funds for formally declared disasters and public health emergencies. Um, but my focus here is going to be mostly on ad hoc uh, supplemental spending. Um, Congress enacted such supplemental spending both during the Great Recession when it was close to a quarter uh, trillion dollars and over the past year during a pandemic when we were closer to two a trillion dollars. And so that, uh, that supplemental uh, ad hoc support is going to be what we're analyzing here. Now, how do we end up with, with so much um, federal relief for state and local governments, um, even though uh, from today's perspective, state and local government revenues have held up pretty well. Um, I, I think they were, the, the large transfers were mostly ultimately caused by dramatic overestimates of state and local government revenue shortfalls early in the pandemic. Uh, you know, those, those shortfalls were basically based on following two steps. First, there's a revision of macroeconomic forecasts relative to uh, the situation and, and trend prior to the pandemic. And then that was translated into tax revenues. Now, how could what looks like a fairly transparent uh, process lead to dramatically uh, overestimated funding needs? I think one, uh, quite a few analysts relied on the unemployment rate, which turned out to be a poor proxy for state and local tax bases. And secondly, the economy just performed much better than those early pandemic uh, forecasts would have suggested, uh, in part because of uh, dramatic intervention by the federal government through other programs, right? And so between those two uh, aspects, I think you can explain a lot of the difference between sort of an estimated $900 billion that some uh, analysts came up with and uh, the real number, which was closer to, to really to zero. Uh, as, as the economy recovered much faster than expected. Now, uh, setting that aside, and we can go into those, uh, those forecast errors a bit more in the panel discussion, as I, as I assume we, we will. Um, what is the variation that we are going to look at uh, to see what, what effects federal transfers had? Um, we're going to use an instrumental variable approach or we use quasi-experimental variation in how much money different states uh, received. And when I say states, I mean states as well as all the local governments in those states. Um, and that, that variation is as follows. Small states are overrepresented in Congress, mostly uh, because of the fact that every state has the same number of senators, but uh, on, the, on the margins a little bit in the House as well. Um, and what we found, what Jeff Clemens and I found in an, in an earlier paper, is that during the pandemic, this overrepresentation uh, predicts additional federal funds per capita quite well and quite strongly. So here you see it split out by the four different bills. For each bill, we've rank ordered the states based on their representation in Congress from uh, what we call here large, which is the most underrepresented states to small, which is the most overrepresented states. And you see these pretty dramatic differences, uh, in particular in the CARES Act. Uh, you know, this should come as no surprise, obviously, because the, the formula used in the CARES Act for the bulk of uh, of state and local relief funds was very explicitly one that benefited small states uh, by providing uh, a floor of funding to every state, no matter your size. Um, putting it differently and more in a context that, that uh, shows you how, uh, how, how strong the instrument is, uh, here I'm showing you the overall uh, federal aid per resident against number of, res number of representatives per million uh, residents 
And it shows you that, you know, there's just this very strong positive relationship between how well represented you are in Congress and how much aid you received per, per resident, right? So this is uh, almost, uh, almost a one for one uh, relationship uh, with really Wyoming and Vermont, uh, you know, being both dramatically overrepresented and receiving the most funds. And then larger states like Texas, Florida, uh, here at the, at the, at the bottom. Now, of course, uh, to be a valid instrument, uh, to be a valid quasi experiment, this is not the only um, thing we need to ensure is the case. We also need to make sure that the variation is uh, what we call conditionally exogenous, right? That uh, it, 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 um, that the uh, amount of funds that you receive um, varies by how well represented you are in Congress, but that that is not uh, driven by the fact that there are um, factors that uh, both explain, you know, why you are overrepresented in Congress and why you are getting so much money. So, for example, perhaps the most obvious example would be if very small states um, were uh, dramatically uh, worse hit by the COVID pandemic, um, one would expect them to receive more funding as well. Um, but that is that is of course not the case. There's there's and here it's important to keep in mind that a small state, of course, does not necessarily have uh, high population density, uh, which would be you know a route that people at the beginning of the pandemic thought might influence spread of the disease. In fact, a number of the small states are have very low population densities. Um, the small state advantage is uh, also more or less orthogonal to to proxies for dimensions of of uh, state and local government funding needs, including estimates of revenue shocks, a uh, number of economic shocks, size of the public sector in, in each state, and the amount of federal land in each state, right? And so these are, again, factors uh, that would make uh, the, uh, that would explain the relationship um, that, could, that might potentially explain the relationship between representation in Congress and the amount of funds uh, allocated that would not be orthogonal to the economic consequences of the pandemic. And so, you know, we go through a number of these potential um, ways in which our identification strategy could be polluted. And we, you know, I wouldn't be here if we thought that the pollution would be devastating. Um, but, you know, there's much more detail on this in, in the paper. Uh, but let me highlight, that, for example, overrepresentation of small states not as correlate with political partisanship as people often think, right? There's a number of very small, uh, Democratic states, uh, Rhode Island uh, comes to mind, uh, Vermont as well, uh, in addition to uh, uh, small population Republican states um, like Wyoming. Uh, to further uh, address concerns like this, we, we run a large number of robustness checks where we include covariates uh, uh, that control for things like the stringency of anti-COVID measures, et cetera. Um, we also do a pretest and we find that the spending variation isolated by our instrument does not predict changes in employment over the months before the pandemic, right? So it's not that small and large states were in different trends going into the pandemic. Anyway, all that leads us to the production of a large number of tables that look like this. I'm obviously not going to discuss every coefficient here, but you know, for credibility's sake, I figured I'd show you something that looks like a regression table. Um, our core estimate that I would want to uh, uh, attract your attention to here is that um, a million dollars in total aid per resident uh, we find leads to an additional 0. Uh, 78 job months uh, in, in, in state and local employment. Uh, now to go from a job, the number of job months to a number of job years, uh, we, we multiply by 1.5 because our sample covers 18 months and 18 divided by 12 is 1.5. We then invert that number of jobs per million uh, to go from jobs per million to millions of dollars per job. And we get an estimate of $855,000 of, of federal money allocated uh, per state and local uh, government job uh, uh, preserved or, or created. Um, that number is relatively high, I think, relative to estimates in the literature about the, the uh, fallout of the financial crisis. Um, it's also large relative to estimates for other programs in uh, some other programs in the in the COVID era, uh, but there are obvious reasons for that that I'll that I'll go into in a second. Um, if you prefer to see the the time series of estimated effects, uh, this is what it looks like. So the uh, 
most of the impact, uh, I think that is clearly statistically significant, comes first during the summer of 2020, and then during the uh, the subsequent Omicron wave in, in February of 2021. But uh, as you can see, in many months, the confidence intervals are, intersect with zero. So it's really the overall impact that we're more certain of than this, than this time period. Um, the, uh, what, we, what we find is that uh, we do not find significant additional effects in the broader labor market. Um, I'm showing you here what, what the, that same impulse response function looks like for private employment per capita in the, in the top left figure. Uh, and we, we find even, even less evidence, I'd say, for an impact on wages, uh, on income, or, or, or GDP. Right? If, you can, if you squint, you can maybe say, well, you, know, you don't have enough power to, affect the, to, to find effects on, on income. Uh, but even there, you know, the point estimates are, are relatively modest. Now, as I said, this $855,000 uh, impact is large relative to some of the estimates for the PPP program, right? which is, of course, another big COVID era uh, program where you have uh, estimates that go from a, a, a job for each $50,000 spent, which you know, admittedly is an estimate by folks at the Treasury Department who are responsible for implementing the PPP program, to about a quarter, uh, uh, a quarter billion from Otter and his co-authors. This, of course, stands in contrast with estimates for, for some of the other programs, uh, for UI, the expansions as expected right there, the, the impact is negative, right? more mo money for UI, uh, less total employment. And for, for the stimulus checks and the municipal liquidity facility, I don't think people have been able to identify big employment uh, effects. Now, um, again, as I said, these numbers stand in contrast to some of the earlier literature on other periods as well. Uh, there, uh, while we find multipliers of about of about zero, you know, on for, for GDP and income, when I say multiplier, I mean uh, for each million of dollars uh, spent in, in stimulus spending, what is the increase in GDP in in number of millions? Uh, we find a number. We find a number around zero. The literature suggests numbers that range from 0.5 to two, uh, but of course, uh, you know, our Context is a very different one from the typical one. Many of these estimates uh, uh, come from an era where there are, for example, not dramatic restrictions on people's ability to get, engage in economic activity. It does not come from a period of a pandemic when people are concerned about their health and may uh, prefer to not engage in, in, in certain types of activity. Um, and perhaps most importantly, Many of those estimates come from periods where there are aggregate demand shortfalls. That, of course, is not the case for certainly the, the final end, the final bit of our sample period, when instead the economy had started entering an inflationary environment uh, with very tight labor markets. And uh, I would think the, the conventional macroeconomic view would be that additional stimulus would feed into prices, not quantities. Um, and so I, I don't think it's super surprising that our, our um, dollars per job estimates are, are so much higher or that we don't find large impacts on, on these other real variables in our, in our estimates. Um, now, one area that I wanted to highlight where we do find some evidence of effects is in uh, testing efforts. So this is from a, from a separate paper uh, joined with, with John Kearns as well, uh, in addition to, to the other two co-authors. And here, we, we've struggled a little bit to come up with a good intuitive way to, to explain the size of the effects. But what we find is that $1,000 in fiscal relief per resident um, translated into uh, under uh, 1,200 exodos of vaccine being delivered. And that was not a, you know, not a statistically significant effect. But we do find um, an effect on testing that says for each $1,000 in COVID relief per capita, we find an additional 55,000 additional tests per 100,000 uh, uh, people. So that's about, about one test for every, for every two people. So the way we interpret this is that it suggests that uh, state and local governments um, were liquidity constrained when it came to the targeted funding they received for, for testing. And so they could use some of these additional uh, general relief funds to, to ramp up their testing operations. That, that was less of a concern on the vaccination side, where perhaps the uh, health insurance apparatus played a bigger role, uh, and where perhaps also 
uh, demand side issues were were more important. Um, but that we uh, and so we don't we don't see see large effects uh, there. But that you know perhaps this suggests that that the targeting did not did, uh, of specific funds did not work as well as you as you might as might have hoped, and that stating local local governments uh, were able to use some additional flexibility uh, on in, in, at least in this area quite quite productively. Um, that's it for me. I think I look forward to uh, hearing everyone's comments and to. Uh, to hearing uh, Louise's remarks as well. Thank you, Louise. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, tell me if you can see this. You see it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, this, I'm going to talk about um, sort of instead of looking at the question that Stan was like, how did fiscal policy affect state and local, I'm going to sort of start the other way, which is say what happened to the state and local sector during the pandemic, um, sort of more broadly, and then I will talk about how important money was or wasn't as one. This book, the, the, what I'm talking about is from a chapter that I wrote for uh, uh, Hamilton uh, and Hutchins Center, uh, both at Brookings Project called Recession Remedies. Um, which goes through all the fiscal policy responses to COVID, um, checks and UI and a bunch of different things, um, and tries to say, what did we learn that we should learn about, uh, that should we think about for the next recession? So this is really a little advertisement. You can Google recession remedies and you'll see um, a really, um, if I do say so myself, I think a nice volume. Um, okay, so three big questions. So the basic story of the pandemic for the state and local sector, you heard some of it already, revenues did quite well. State and local government got tons of federal aid, but employment fell sharply and remains well below pandemic levels today. So the three big questions I have are why did revenues hold up so well and why were the projections so wrong? Given the strong revenues and about a trillion dollar in aid, how is it that employment in the sector is so weak? And third, if they're not hiring people, what are state and local governments doing with all the aid they've received? So you can see a lot of overlap with the presentation just heard. So as you heard, in, this, in the spring of 2020, analysts projected state and local revenue losses of up to $900 billion over two years. In fact, revenues combined 2020 and 21 actually exceeded reasonable pre-pandemic projections. So in this table, it's, it says, how did revenue losses compare to what would have happened if revenues had actually increased 4% a year, which is pretty strong um, increase um, and basically a very reasonable, optimistic even uh, pre-pandemic projection. You see they were declined 71 in 2020, but up 145 in 2020, 21. This is state and local fiscal years, uh, state fiscal years. And so altogether they actually were higher. Okay, so revenues came in actually higher than you would have expected pre-pandemic. Um, why were the revenues projections so wrong? As Stan said, a lot of it was based on really pessimistic um, economic projections. Um, you know, when that unemployment rate shot up to 14% in April, private projectors and CBO thought it was gonna take a really long time for the unemployment rate to come down. If you say, okay, so using the historical rules of thumb that contributed to the projections of the $900 billion losses that we saw, you fed in actual economics, what would have happened? Well, you would have gotten much, much smaller projected revenue losses, but still you would have had some revenue losses depending on which rule of thumb you use, particularly if you use an unemployment rate, as Stan suggests is not the best way of predicting um, state and local revenues. And it was in a very common rule of thumb. Um, so, you, but you still have had some losses, but much smaller than what actually happened. So that was the biggest reason. The other things, as Stan mentioned, is there was an unprecedented fiscal response. And when you're looking in history and you're looking at relationships with things like an unemployment rate and revenues, you know, you're sort of holding the historical policy response constant implicitly. And we had an ahistorical, just a huge, huge policy response. That did two things. One, it helped the economy. So UI and checks, it bolstered household finances, it kept consumption strong, it kept the housing market strong. All those implicitly are supporting the state and local sector through sales taxes, property taxes. And then actually UI is taxable income in most states. So the fact that we at the beginning of the pandemic, when unemployment was so high, replaced more than 100% of wages for many states that would have actually been a boost to revenues. Now, in the end, after the federal government um, uh, forgave about the first $10,000 of UI from taxes, some states went along too, um, but that wasn't clear uh, that was going to happen. So the UI itself would have boosted directly state and local revenues. 
And then third, usually a stock market tumbles in a recession, right? So again, that's implicit in the historical relationship. And that happened early in the pandemic, but then it completely recovered and was quite strong. So that's going to be boosting taxes uh, for capital gains taxes. And then finally, this recession was unusually concentrated among low-wage workers. So uh, uh, recessions are always concentrated among low-wage workers, but the fact this was about service sectors, delivery, people really in the front line, and it was particularly low-wage. And that means that for any change in the unemployment rate, the change in income and taxable income is going to be much smaller. Okay. Okay. As we said, there was massive, massive aid to state and local government. Stan said around a trillion. I get almost exactly a trillion. You know, it depends on how you count it, but you can see my chapter. We go through all the details of how you get to it. Some of it was general aid directly to states. So that's $100 billion. Uh, it was the Medicaid match, then $150 billion in this coronavirus relief fund, and then $350 billion in the uh, ARPA. Um, that adding to 600, but then there was all this targeted aid for administrative expenses, aid through K-12, through public institutions of higher education, health providers, their public hospitals that got some of that. So it adds up to about a trillion dollars. That's just massive. Um, as Stan said, relative to, you know, during the Great Recession, we have an estimate of $275 billion state local government. So way, 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 way larger. Um, and yet, as I said, employment is still well below pre-pandemic levels except for state education. So let me walk you through this slide quickly. So the blue is state, the red is local, the line that uh, the dotted line is excluding education and the uh, straight lines are um, education. Uh, I mean, sorry, the dotted lines are education. I got it wrong. And the other ones are excluding education. So you can see that employment fell like a rock right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, everywhere except for state government, state government excluding education. Um, state and local recovered some, the red lines, but they're about 4% below the level they were before the pandemic and between like 4 to 6% below what you would have expected them to be by this time after two years um, still today. Uh, state education has completely recovered and looks kind of about where you would have expected it to be. Uh, but state is interesting, the state ex education didn't really suffer much at the beginning, but it just has kind of been going down slowly over time and it's now about 3% below the level it was. So let's compare it to the Great Recession. So compared to the Great Recession, what was interesting about the changes to employment is they were way quicker, right? You didn't see this massive layoffs at, at any time during the Great Recession, uh, which is shown in green. You saw this kind of gradual declines on the state level, you did not see education declining. A lot of people went to school during the Great Recession, but for ex excluding education, decline, decline. We kind of got to that same level practically, but much faster, um, right? So uh, it's ironic, we're kind of close to where we would have been about three years after the Great Recession for state um, ex-education. And local uh, went way down, and now we're where we would have been after five years, basically. Right. So the whole thing is quite ironic. One of the reasons we gave so much aid to state and local governments is because the story that we all said at the beginning of the pandemic was in the Great Recession, we did not give state and local governments enough money and they cut employment. So let's make sure we don't do that this time. And so we gave them a lot of money and they still cut employment dramatically. Um, so, OK, so why did employment fall so much? So I think the first thing to note is that the huge declines, the incredibly rapid declines in the spring of 2020, I think are, um, are mostly about, we closed offices, we closed schools, we didn't need cafeteria workers, we didn't need bus drivers, we, we couldn't have all the people in our offices. So a lot of it was really just sort of pandemic related and not budget related or anything like that, okay? Um, in addition, some evidence from literature, you just heard another paper that money did matter at the beginning of the pandemic. I would say the idea that money matters, I mean, money might matter, you might be able to find it, um, but obviously it's not um, determinative because we've given them so much money and revenues are flush and employment is still low. So money may matter, but that's not why employment fell so much, not lack of money. There's no way, right? Um, there's some evidence that giving money directly to cities and counties instead of just to states did help maintain employment in the spring of 2020. So that's just something interesting from a policy perspective. That first $150 billion in aid went to states and some very large governments. The population had to be greater than $500,000, uh, 500,000 people. Uh, the second round in the ARP 
said, you know what, that didn't work that well. It was really, it didn't necessarily flow through from, you know, especially from red states to blue cities. And so it went directly to many, many, many local governments, many thousands and thousands of local governments. And so um, that's just something that can be interesting to look at uh, in uh, eventually to see if that mattered. Okay. So I did some of this variation across the states to try to understand the unemployment, the employment changes. I tried a whole bunch of stuff. I had like what revenue, what were their expected revenue losses in, in the summer of 2020? Well, I had measures of shutdowns and school closings and cases and death rates. I had things like, well, were the places that were scarred from the Great Recession, they had employment or revenue losses, were those ones that cut off? None of that stuff worked very well. Um, so I found a few factors that did explain the cross state variation. So states that imposed hiring freezes at the beginning of the pandemic did have slower employment growth. So some states employed hiring freezes. And they took a really long time to lift them, even though they were flush with money. So that is a way that money mattered. Um, localities that were more dependent on states for K through 12 financing had bigger education employment losses. So I think in the spring of 2020, there were local governments who were hearing they were not going to get money from states. Uh, state budgets were, were it was starting a new fiscal year. And so they cut back really a lot. Um, and then the other thing that I think is quite interesting is that states that were sort of more COVID averse is the way I think about it, as measured by vaccination rates, had a slower recovery in employment. So I'll show you that picture. So on the right is the percent of the population over five fully vaccinated by January 2022. And this is the decline in employment from October 2020, 2019 to October 2020. And you can see that the states that I think about it as caring more about COVID um, had bigger employment losses, which would make sense if you think this is coming from closing schools or closing offices, or even like, you know, Virginia didn't close offices, but it still had social distancing so that the number of people who are working in an office was gonna be much smaller because you know, every other booth of the DMV is empty, for example. So I think that those are all related to COVID. So I think, um, what the other thing that I think is quite interesting is if you're trying to say, okay, so if I tell, if I look at the pattern across states in the timing of employment losses, you know, if I see what happens in the spring of 2020, is that how predictive of, it, of that is that of what happens later? Is it the fact that once you lay somebody off, you're just it just takes a lot longer to build up? That's sort of true, but less true. So if you look in rest to it in the spring of 2020. So if you look in the spring of 2020 versus the fall of 2020 at the employment declines, you know, they're related, but they're not that strongly related. A lot of places had big employment declines and then hired right back up as the economy opened up or brought or laid, brought back all the people who had been laid off. Once you get to October of 2020, it's really, really a much tighter fit. So if I tell you by the after the economy is reopened after that first initial shutdown and, and reopening, then the states that had, had sort of big deficits in October of 2020 still had up to bigger deficits by May of 2021. Uh, it's probably still true today. I haven't done the most recent ones. Okay. Now, state and local governments do want to hire, right? So they're sitting on all this money. They're hiring this down. These are from the JOLT series. Um, of these are hiring openings. So job openings for state and local governments together. They don't have local versus state. They have education versus not. They look quite similar. You can see that, you know, openings fell in the spring, sort of right after the pandemic started, especially in education. That's the green line. And then beginning in 2021, when the vaccine started rolling out, openings have been up and up and up. So there are a lot of openings. Um, and so states are trying to hire, right? So I think they shut down, they got a bunch of money, they try to hire, but they have had trouble hiring. Um, so um, you can look at here are the hiring rates and the separations. So the high rates in green and the separations in blue. So this huge separations were the layoffs in the spring of 2020 and some quits as well. Um, and then you can see it was kind of like they weren't in a whole bunch of hiring. And then hiring has increased recently. So um, that the blue line has gone up, but so have this green line separations, that's quits. So you're saying they're hiring more people, except more people are leaving right now. Um, and you know whether or not that's part of the story of this sort of great resignation or whether or not these jobs are just become, you hear lots of stories about how these jobs become worse jobs uh, because you can't work virtually. Kids have a lot of problems for school teachers, the whole issue about guns in school. So they're not making a lot of headway even though they are hiring and have a lot of job openings. Uh, if you look at pay, you can look at pay. This is from the ECI that holds composition of pay constant. This is quarterly ECI at annual rates. You can see it took a while for the state and local sector to raise pay. State and local is everything except for the green. The green line is private. 
um, and the, all the blues and purples are different, the state and local um, in different, we got public administration and health and in education. Um, and it all is this purple line right here. So you can see pay has gone up, but has not kept pace with the private sector. So the jobs have probably gotten worse. The pay has gotten less competitive. Um, and so they're having a lot of trouble hiring. So what are states doing with all the money? So, you know, one of the things that I learned by doing this project is like, we have terrible data for the state and local sector in terms of looking for timely data. And it's a huge sector, it's 13% of employment. Um, and uh, it, this is a real problem. Um, so we don't really have official data except for state governments for fiscal year 2020, right? We don't really have anything on, on local. Um, we do have a report from the National Association of State Budget Offices which is really helpful. Um, except one of the problems is that those are just as states report them and states report unemployment insurance spending really differently. Some of them have it in there, some of them have part of it in there. It's really hard to back out. I tried, I couldn't. Um, and so that makes it hard to interpret the top line. Still, if you look sort of item by item, NASL does show very sharp increases for K through 12 education and public assistance, right? So if they're sending out checks to people, um, states in 2021, Overall spending, excluding other, because other has got uh, this UI thing, which I don't um, know how to deal with, although it also has a lot of COVID spending, um, increased about 5% in 2020 and 10% in 2021. That's a huge number for state and local, very massive increase in spending. If you look at the BEA data, the data that actually are in GDP, um, the spending looks quite soft. You don't see that strength. And so uh, they will revise that once they have official census data. Um, and either the NASBO data are not going to sort of have the same measures or it's going to mean that GDP has been a bit stronger than we think. Um, states are considering tax cut. You read about them all the time, what are they doing with money, they're doing tax cuts. But according to the NASBO, at least, they don't seem that large. The mid-year state tax cuts that actually uh, were a pass were like $1 billion, and the proposed tax cuts are about $15 billion or 1.3% of general revenue. Um, so tax cuts, uh, but not massive. Um, and then finally, states have saved a lot of the money, right? And um, this is just states, because this is from NASBO, this is total balances. So that's rainy day. And then if you have money just in your general fund, that's not in a named rainy day fund, it's including here too, so that you can see balances went up like crazy in 2021, 2022. And I think this is been, and projected to come down. Um, so, um, so and, and then a lot of money went to states, as I said, especially from the ARP. And that might be sitting in late local coffers as well, right? We don't have any data on local rainy day funds, but so some of it may be sitting there. there. So that's it. Thank you so much. Can you stop sharing your screen, Louise? Oh, yes, sir. If I can find other oh, ways. Great. Uh, thank you very much to both of you. So here's the plan going forward. Uh, we have a terrific panel that we put together because it represents different perspectives on this, the situation at state and local governments, both during the pandemic and in the and right now. Uh, we have Tracy Gordon from the Irvin Institute, Sharon Kiyoko from the University of Washington, Kate Nass from the state of Oregon, who also happens to be president of the National Association of State Budget Officers, um, Nick Samuels from Moody's, and Louise and Stan and some of Stan's co-authors are gonna join us as well. As I said earlier, if you have questions or comments, you can post them at Slido, that's sli.do, hashtag Muni Finance, or do the same on Twitter. Um, and Nick, maybe I can start with you. So um, from the point of view of state and local credit, uh, presumably state and local credit looked pretty good given that they didn't actually lose a lot of money, a lot of money. What did you observe during the pandemic that may have surprised you? And then what kind of condition are state and local finances in right now from the point of view of a credit rating agency? Yeah, just, just a little question there, right? Um, so <laughs> so um, thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, like we just talked about, right? This obviously was a very large and unexpected type of downturns, but, you know, there was a, a couple of things to take of note going into the the COVID downturn. And you know, I think the first one is that heading into this, two thirds of the states were in our two top rating categories, AAA and AA1. So that implies that they had the most fiscal flexibility, the strongest tools available to them um, to withstand some type of downturn. And one of those was that states 
um, had tremendously strong reserves coming in to COVID. Uh, more than half the states had reserve levels that by more than one times could cover the largest revenue decline that they had had, one year revenue decline that they had had since 2000. So really tremendously strong reserve levels relative to the size of their revenues. Um, also, fixed costs for debt service, pensions, and retiree health care, while there's some outliers, some notable outliers, um, really are not a burden for the state sector. So coming into a period where states had to really navigate a lot of, of different things um, uh, financially, they had a lot of flex to be able to do that. Um, so then, of course, as, as we just talked about, um, the federal government stepped in with, you know, a really extraordinary set of extraordinary measures to try to help both the economy at large and um, states specifically. And like we just talked about, you know, um, extended unemployment benefits, assistance to small businesses, rental assistance, emergency food assistance, those types of things kept uh, property owners paying property taxes and consumers spending. And um, we're doing this meeting virtually. I'm now a fully remote worker, kept people with office going jobs working and their wage income. And we talked a, you know, a little bit about the early, early pandemic um, market blip, but then the markets did very strongly. So um, you know, income tax is performing very, very, very strongly. Um, and then of course we had direct aid to state and local governments in the form of ARPA, $350 billion worth, um, you know, very, very significant, and direct aid to downstream entities, mass transit, higher ed, the types of things that might um, need additional assistance um, directly from states themselves. And so, you know, really notably through that period, we had one state downgrade. We had a, a couple uh, changes in outlooks to negative that since have either gone to stable or, or to positive, but only one downgrade um, through that whole period. And I think that really, you know, looking back um, is surprising to me, having also been through um, as a rating analyst, some prior downturns um, as well. Um, so, you know, we also, we talked about reserves. Only 11 states drew on their rainy day funds or their uh, other budget reserves through that period because there was so much other um, uh, money flowing through them. And that's really remarkable. And those monies have largely been um, restored into those reserve funds now, and then some. Um, so I think you know, the, the, the more forward looking story now is that states are even better positioned than they were coming into the COVID downturn in terms of reserves at least. Um, we published a report last week on the state of California that's got a budget reserve now equal to 17% of, of revenue, which is like remarkable for a state like California that has a lot of revenue volatility. Um, and based on our own metrics, that's more of a AAA rated state level of reserves um, than anything else. Um, so, you know, a lot of states, their economies are not back to normal. We're talking about employment and things like that are not back to normal. But I think in terms of budgets, uh, you know, another thing to note, maybe we'll talk about this later also, very, very, very few states have been issuing cash flow notes um, in the last couple of years to balance the mismatch between revenues and expenditures. Um, I think only two states in the fiscal year that just ended two weeks ago, the sum of it less than a billion dollars, really remarkably um, little, um, a lot of liquidity there for states now. And that is a very, very credit positive thing. Interesting. So Kate, um, tell us how the world looks from Eugene, Oregon. Uh, do you recognize the characterization that Louise, Stan, and Nick are giving? What, what's, what's unusual about Oregon and what do you see that's, that's <laughs> typical? Thanks, David. Uh, so as, Nat, as part of NASBO, I feel like every time we talk to somebody, um, our, our colleagues across the states, it's always everyone has their own unique version. So every state, you look at one state, you see the one state, and I think we all know that. And so... Um, I have been saying, and I think a number of people have felt this, um, over the last year, two years, I just feel like I've gone through what I call the budget whiplash. And so um, in, in our state, we do an official revenue forecast every quarter. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was, um, it was pretty uncommon to see a, 
you know, a $500 million swing on our revenue forecast, just as a heads up, like, you know, just to give quantified. Now, almost every single revenue forecast has had that type of a swing in the last two years. And so it's just been from going to pulling um, reduction lists together of what kind of horrific reductions we're going to have to pull together and um, make recommendations to the governor on how to how to balance. I mean, we're, we were looking at, you know, I think an 18% reduction when we first went into the 2020, the spring 2020 um, timeframe. And then as you're all hearing from everyone else here on these on this panel is that didn't come true. And so we had done all these um, hiring freezes and everything. And a number of agencies had to go through layoffs because of their specific revenue streams, but not, it wasn't across the board. We did more hiring freezes and tried to just slow the, slow the rollout of new programs. But then once we saw that our revenues were coming back and then the federal aid was, or the federal funding was coming through, we kind of started, we had to ramp back up. And so to move from doing a, almost a hard stop to a ramp up again was just incredibly, um, I don't know, it was just a whiplash. I, I mean, everyone knows it's been difficult, but it was definitely, it felt like a whiplash. And then to continue to see um, additional federal funding come through and then revenue is still continuing um, to come in. And how do you deploy that funding in a one-time basis as opposed to creating this ongoing structural imbalance has been really, has been a real struggle for um, Oregon. And so we're watching that pretty closely. Uh, Oregon's a biennial budget state. So we have a little bit, when we do a two-year budget, we have a little bit of time to kind of, it's not, it's, it has its pluses and minuses and talking to my colleagues across the country, but um, it does give it a little bit more time to do some planning between one uh, budget proposal to another. Um, so yeah, so I feel like that's kind of where we've been in Oregon is just this whiplash. And I know that's probably where everyone else has been too. Um, and so I did want to speak a little bit because the hiring is a thing, um, especially in this, in, uh, specific programs and specific um, classifications. Um, I took a little look at our uh, kind of where we've been over the course of the last, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 years. And we, in Oregon, where our legislature has a position authority. So they actually, in their budgets, when they pass the budget for a specific agency, they say, there's this many number of positions allowed for that agency. And so we kind of do a position control as well as then there's the vacancy of how you actually hire into those positions. And what I've noticed is that our vacancy rate has been creeping up. Um, what's weird is it actually started to creep up kind of right before the pandemic and then it creeped up even more. Um, but on top of that, because of additional funding coming in and our revenue picture, there's been an interest in having more staff too. So we have gone, we've also increased the number of staff so that we were supposed to, so we've been increasing the number of actual individual um, employees, but it's not to the level that we need in order to make the programs that we've been authorized to do um, actually go forward. So we've been really struggling and there's been real, it's been very specific um, in certain areas agencies and programs, like for example, our Department of Corrections is running almost a 20% vacancy in their, um, in their staffing for and the institutions. So those are the kind of uh, places that we're kind of running into problems. Thanks. Um, just an example, when you say, I can understand why you don't wanna add a lot of people if you have one-time money, but are there one-time investments that you're making in Oregon? Is there an example or two you can give? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, so uh, we did some infrastructure, obviously, with especially using some of the federal fundings um, that we that came in through the state. We partnered with local entities on kind of getting some infrastructure work done. Um, from a hiring perspective, we we didn't do bonuses, but we um, we've had a couple of hiring bonuses. Uh, there was cost of living increases where uh, that did kind of, and that's been helpful with, in, with where we, we are with inflation right now, but probably not to the level that I think really is making a difference given the fact that it was authorized prior to where we are right now. Um, we've done, um, there's been some large, it's, 
uh, like school projects where we've helped different school districts with their um, mm. with inter like getting schools moved and things like that um, to get them kind of more in their own infrastructure. And just to pick up on a question that's being asked in the chat, did you actually lay people off in Oregon or just stop hiring? Um, we did have to do some layoffs in some agencies. So like, um, for example, our lottery agency had to do with layoffs. Um, our parks and rec had to do layoffs. And so there's in Oregon where there were certain, where there are certain funding streams that we were seeing a dec decline very quickly, we did have to do some layoffs, but for the, but it was kind of isolated to revenue streams. Thanks. Sharon, you've done a lot of looking at the, what state and local governments are reporting. Does the tone of this conversation uh, coincide with your observations that we expected worse, we got better, and now states are in pretty good position, fortunately, as we head towards another recession? Absolutely. And just to echo what Nick, Nick Samuels uh, mentioned, um, yes, yeah, states were, were very well positioned uh, before the start of the pandemic. It was the strongest position, at least with the data that I have, um, in the last two decades. So it was, it was a strong position going in. Um, also, what we, we see from the data is the fact that um, the general fund balances, again, as Nick mentioned, is uh, significantly higher. At least uh, half the states were reporting double digit uh, fund balances, so at least 18% or more in the general fund balance. And then when you look at the unassigned fund balance, which is the money that they have the most flexibility, um, at, during the Great Recession, uh, those unassigned fund balances were actually negative in 2009, 2010. And then you see in 2020 and 2021, they were actually positive and it actually grew from about 5.5% uh, median in 2020 to about 11.5% in 2021. So it was a really strong position at the end of the last fiscal year, of course, 2022 data is going to come out when the financial statements are published. But that, that just showed um, tremendous strength, at least in the reserves for the states that they had um, coming into the pandemic and then also just comparing it to the Great Recession. It was a, a really strong position. One other thing to highlight is I think just looking at changes in revenues and changes in expenditures and just noting the fact that um, Expenditures also grew significantly, um, especially when you look at the entirety of the government, as Louise mentioned, including the unemployment funds, including uh, public universities. Um, spending did actually go up and it actually went up in double digits. But the good story there is there was a lot of federal stimulus dollars that went into state coffers. So again, also the revenues were up in the double digits. So for the first time, and again, two decades, we have the states reporting surpluses in what we considered a recession. Um, and nearly every state, I think I have only about four or five states that actually reported uh, a deficit in that period and a very small deficit. Whereas in um, 2009, 2010, practically every state reported deficits and reported deficits over multiple years. So we're talking about 2008, 2009, 2010. So it was a really strong performance. And again, it's no surprise that agencies like Moody's, Fitch, and S&P uh, didn't actually downgrade the states, or you just didn't see a wave of downgrades for state governments because their positions were very strong. The revenues were actually more robust. The federal stimulus dollars were flowing to state governments much faster. Um, so they gave these governments a, a lot of cushion. And then also the data shows that um, debt issuance was also very low because these governments just had a lot of money um, that they had either in reserves or coming in because, again, the stimulus dollars plus also um, individual spending um, through those um, direct benefits from the federal government. Thanks. So, Tracy, um, I know you have lots of interesting things to say, and I'm going to let you say all of them, but can I ask you one question? So, looking in the rearview mirror, everything looks great. But looking through the windshield, we have rising interest rates, high inflation, we may be on the cusp of a recession, and the federal tap is pretty much closed. 
And I'm not particularly convinced that it will reopen in the next recession. So I'm curious, do you, what do you, what, what's on your worry list looking forward? And then whatever other points you want to make are welcome. Yeah, I was tempted to kick off by saying I'm glad that states are in such a good position because they're going to need it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not only worried about the headwinds that you mentioned, but also sort of federal, um, 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 you know, it, there's always this entrenched difference between the federal, as I don't need to tell people on this call, the federal government and state and local government. And people in federal government will say things like, Governors don't even balance their budgets because they get, you know, 20 to 30 percent of their revenues from federal grants. And then people like me and others on this call will say those grants are not just pure fiscal support. Those are funds that they that the federal government gives to state and local governments because they want them to do something with them. Um, but I make that point only to say that there is this sort of inherent suspicion of state and local governments in Washington. And I, I think a lot of people have focused on the magnitude of the assistance that's gone out the door already. The eye-popping numbers that Louise presented, nearly a trillion dollars. You know, I'm old enough to remember back when the Recovery Act in 2009, everyone thought was huge at $280 billion. And 150 was flexible, um, allowed states to use it with very few strings attached. And the 600 billion now is just really, really shocking. Um, but I think the design, the structure really matters as well. And I wrote a blog a while ago um, noting that during the Great Recession, we talked about the three T's, timely, targeted, temporary. And I really thought that we should be focusing now on the three F's. So fast, flexible, formula driven. And Congress did pretty well with fast, right? It within three weeks in March of 2020, they got $2.5 trillion out the door, not just for state and local governments, but to spur the economy. And as Sam's work has shown, you know, and Louise's as well, those checks to individuals, those checks to businesses did a lot for state and local governments, for property, excuse me, for personal income taxes and for sales taxes, which everybody thought uh, were gonna plummet and which we saw plummet, but a lot of that was due to the shift in um, filing deadlines um, that uh, very rightfully the federal government and states passed because they didn't want people um, you know, seeking help filing their taxes and interacting with other folks. So it was a social distancing thing. Um, so the federal government did pretty well on FAST uh, flexible, not so much, in particular the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, had to be used for only, I don't need to remind people, but you know, only COVID-related expenses by the end of the year, although that got extended, and also they really loosened up the definition of what uh, COVID-related meant. Um, and it couldn't be used for things that had already been approved in the prior, prior budget, which sounded like a weird uh, incentive for places that were actually prepared with robust systems. Um, but they missed an opportunity on the formula driven. So they basically, um, the CARES Act um, uh, uh, was per capita, which is more politically expedient, especially if you get those small states um, uh, on board. Um, but the, um, the part that was dialing up existing formulas really didn't take into account local economic conditions. And that's so strange to me because for years leading up to this recession, there was this persistent drumbeat about automatic stabilizers need to look at local conditions, which they did to a certain extent um, in targeting the aid under the American Rescue Plan, but not the timing. So you could have had triggers, you could have had on off switches that would have um, taken effect if, if, for example, the federal government overshot and uh, sent too much money to the state and local sector. So that was a missed opportunity. And now here we are where my colleague, Lucy Diane has tracked state revenue forecasts and they're basically uh, flat in fiscal 23. Um, California, New York, other states are warning of the same headwinds that David mentioned. Um, as my colleague, Richard Oksher has shown, 31 states um, passed income tax, uh, sorry, passed some kind of tax cut this year, um, 29 states last year. And some of those are income tax cuts, rate cuts, which, are, uh, which benefit everybody. And so they're very expensive. Um, a more targeted increase in a refundable credit like the earned income tax credit is less expensive, um, potentially more sustainable. But there have been you know, pressures to um, suspend or prevent increases in gas taxes or to um, uh, give people relief from grocery taxes. Um, sometimes just rebates are going out the door. So I think this shows that it's also not really politically sustainable to hold on to reserves of something like 17% uh, of the budget. So there will be pressure on the savings that states are building up, and there will be suspicion at the federal level, at the federal level, because there's a sense of well, we just gave you all this money. Um, the silver lining, I think, is that just like with the Recovery Act, maybe more so 
recently, there has been a lot more communication between these sectors of government. And I think that will be helpful in terms of sort of an early heads up or um, better uh, information about the timing of assistance, which they got so long during the Great Recession at the federal level. Um, and the reporting. Um, so there's been you know, a lot more accountability, a lot more transparency. I think that might help um, with distrust. Um, and this focus on equity is really interesting to me. There are these annual performance reports that um, states, cities, and counties above a certain population level need to file to show how their investments are benefiting equity, how different people are coming to the table and deciding how funds should be used. And I think that might have some lasting benefit. Um, so, uh, you know, some headwinds ahead, some silver linings, um, but I do worry that there was a, a big missed opportunity. Thanks. Louise, um, there's some questions on the Slido about how good is the data on state and local employment? Did, did we, is there some, are there issues with how the BLS collects the data? Were there uh, unusual patterns in seasonal adjustment? And were there really layoffs or just freezes? So could you speak to that? Yeah, so um, the, there were differences in seasonal patterns uh, in the sense that in the spring of 2020, uh, a lot of people who are typically laid off in the summer were laid off earlier. There, uh, and so you could see a recovery in the summer of 2020. And that wasn't necessarily people being brought back, but just that you're sort of catching up with the people who would have been laid off anyhow, those bus drivers and janitors. There were layoffs. Um, uh, I, the picture I showed you of separations, um, that was a lot, mostly layoffs. And one thing actually I was kind of interested in Kate's um, view, which is one of the things we've heard was one of the reasons that if you were a state government, um, you were doing your lower wage workers a big favor in laying them off rather than paying them and telling them not to come to work because unemployment insurance during that time was going to be more generous than um, their wages. And so there were a whole bunch of layoffs. I don't know how much of like I, the, just a story we've heard, but there were layoffs and the data are pretty good. So um, there are two sets of data. There's a household data and then there's establishment data. The establishment data is practically, it's kind of got, got every state and a lot of local government. It's quite good. And we've checked it with this QCEW, which is the data that comes out later, but it's actually like quite, you know, uh, administrative data. And it's, it's, it's pretty good. So the data are good. The definitely were different seasonal patterns. Um, but the, one of the reasons I do everything always related to an, a month uh, not everything is seasonally adjusted once you get down to the to, to the sort of education and non-education. Um, and so I always do things relative to the same month, but I think the data are pretty good, basically. Employment is down. I don't think there's any question about that. Stan, um, what, what do you conclude from your work and the conversation so far about how we ought to think about aid to state and local governments if we slide into recession in 2023? or 2024, in part because the Fed wants to slow demand and bring down inflation. Should we do anything? Should we do different things? I mean, I think it would be, we, we, I think we should do different things. I think the, the, the goal should really be to, to let state and local governments plan as early as possible in the recession and knowing how much, how much money they will, they will end up receiving. I think that money we should distribute just, you know, based on national indicators of how hard the economy is hit. I'm a little skeptical of trying to adjust the state economic conditions along the lines of what, what Tracy uh, suggested, just because it's, it's so easy to, to game, uh, to start gaming conditions in, if you're, it, once you start out, once you start doing that. So before the pandemic, one of the leading proposals was to, uh, to tie uh, this kind of relief to uh, increases in in the FMAP, in the matching rate for Medicaid. Uh, now, you know the reason to do that. I think and a lot of the people who who proposed it would probably even acknowledge that it, is that a lot of the money goes to is based on your inframarginal number of Medicaid recipients, right? And so th that kind of approach. You know, there's some element of, you know, if the number goes up dramatically, you get more Medicaid money, but mostly it just depends on how much, how large your Medicaid program is to begin with. And so I have this paper with, with Jeff Clemens and Bennett Polito, where we show that the FMAP increase that we did this time was targeted so poorly uh, 
um, that it was less related to your increase in the number of Medicaid beneficiaries as a state than the ARP money was, which wasn't tied to Medicaid at all. And so I, I don't know that our political system is set up to, to target based on real state uh, level economic conditions. Because even the ARP money was a little sneaky how that formula was designed, right? It was based on absolute numbers of, of the unemployed. And so that funding helped states that have high structural levels of unemployment, which of course is also, you know, a set of states that that you know we know which states those are. And so I'm I'm skeptical. So I would base it on on national economic aggregates uh, and make clear in advance what the you know, what the amount of funding is going to look like based on those aggregates so that state and local governments can uh, can plan ahead, uh, then if economic, if economic conditions uh, get better faster than we expect, that means states won't, you know, won't get as much money because it will continue to be tied to the evolution of those national economic aggregates. Uh, but of course, if the economy recovers more rapidly, that also means the state and local governments will have more revenue. And so, you know, it would still let them budget uh, with with a lot more certainty than uh, the the way it's been now, um, and so I would be hesitant to to focus too much on on the economic conditions of specific states. Uh, let me also add a note on a on a different point on the 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 reduction in state and local employment relative to trend. I don't think that's something we should be super concerned about, or really even that it's something that should be very surprising. So if you look at the numbers that that Louise presented. Um, we're maybe three or four percent below uh, where we were before the pandemic. Add some trend growth, and you're at six or seven percent. Seven percent vacancies is about where the economy as a whole is, and so I don't think that's super surprising, right? So you right now we have about 11 million vacancies and 158 or so million employed workers. Right, that's seven percent, um, and so I, I don't think it's surprising that the state and local sector would have uh, a similar shortfall in in workforce as the as the rest of the economy uh, does. I certainly don't think the federal government should try to push that that rate lower for state and local government than it, than it is for the private sector. Um, but so that, those are my- the private sector employment has returned to exactly. pre levels and state yeah. it hasn't. That's so, not. So it seems like right. there is some- You don't like that way of thinking about it? No, no. because the, the vacancies are about, about how many jobs they post. So what yeah. you're saying is they're not posting as many. Relative to what they post, maybe they're not having more trouble filling them. But yeah. they're not posting as many as you would expect, given where they were before the pandemic. Sure. So they are clearly below. Like they're second to, to leisure and hospitality in the deficit relative to where you would expect. So I think what you're saying is maybe they're not having that much trouble hiring um, Tracy, relative to other, 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 other sectors. Tracy, how would you design automatic stabilizers to avoid the, all the issues that Stan just raised? So I guess I, um, I'm a big fan of that paper on Medicaid, but the whole point of the FMAP boost was to just cut states a larger check than what they were expecting and have that flexible relief. So, um, you know, yes, there might be an increase in Medicaid enrollees and it would help cover that too, but mainly it was supposed to be flexible fiscal relief. And I completely agree. It should have been like the Lesnar Recovery Act um, somehow tied to local unemployment rates and that would have made it more targeted. Um, but I guess, you know, I have a, paper that's been long in development with um, Lynn Berman and uh, Nikki Ayeri at the Tax Policy Center, where we try to implement something like the SOM rule. Um, so sustained unemployment um, over a three month period or a change in the unemployment rate um, would allow these um, you know, automatic payments to kick in. And I agree completely with Sam's point about how certainty would be very helpful so that state and local governments don't do things that are, you know, I, I think it's worth remembering that at the start of this states thought that they were almost done with their budgets. Um, and so they had to make some big adjustments in a short period of time. Um, and as Louise mentions, you know, it was easier to do layoffs if people had outside opportunities. Um, and in some cases, you know, people didn't want to come to work. So I think, you know, there are formulas that are out there. I'm, I'm not as concerned about political manipulation. If you're talking about something like an unemployment rate, you'd have to be a pretty dastardly governor to purposely drive down your, um, employment to, um, but I, but I also take Stan's point that actually deciding on a formula, you know, these are not philosopher Kings that are coming up responding to political incentives and you know maybe looking at numbers versus rates is the outcome of that process. Thanks. Uh, Nick, so we now enter a period of high inflation and rising interest rates. 
how does that affect the outlook for state and local fiscal conditions in general, but also for their willingness to spend on infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, it creates, I think, you know, obviously pretty obvious um, headwinds. You know, one is, you know, the cost of finance capital. And in, in our system in the U.S., you know, 99% or something of the debt that state and local governments issue is fixed rate level debt service um, amortizing um, debt for capital. And we know about infrastructure condition, right, that there's a lot of need and state and local governments have a lot of need to be able to access the capital markets um, uh, uh, to, to finance that infrastructure. That's become um, much more uh, expensive now, you know, both in terms of getting into the market and then you know, take a, a typical debt issuance of what you can get for what you've just issued because material costs are so high, right? The, the producer price index for construction materials is kind of leading the, the inflation metrics. It's at you know, the highest that it's ever been and construction wages too. Um, so that creates pressure, credit pressure. Um, uh, you know, we, the whole discussion just on wages creates credit pressure for the state, state sector also. I mean, Kate talked about 20% vacancies and corrections. Those aren't really discretionary jobs that we can say, you know, we'll get to this later. Those are pretty essential, very direct public um, sector types of jobs. You're only going to get, you know, certain types of people. And you're probably going to have to pay more to get people into those jobs. And of course, you know, you are hiring people at higher wages now or giving colas or things like that. You're also memorializing, you know, some of this aspect of inflation, possibly longer than inflation will be. And so that's going to get built into your pension liabilities over time, right? So, I mean, rates are going up in the way that we adjust pension liabilities. Those liabilities are going to come down a bit. But to the extent that you raise wages um, uh, now, that will in longer run have have a negative impact. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to add something because it's interesting just on the discussion of, of public sector workforce, right? Because I think, um, you know, we, you know, obviously we talk about, you know, there, you can probably make more in the private sector, right? And so that, you know, people are looking towards those jobs. There's also a, just something generational, right? There've been a lot of retirements from the public sector and that's left um, uh, a lot of openings. And then, you know, I think somewhat more anecdotally, I, I think that you know, governments have probably been stricter about return to office and, and how that type of work um, is gonna be done versus the private sector. And if you are a younger worker who you know, could not conceive of working for the same place for 20 or 30 years and isn't all necessarily all that interest in a, interested in a government pension, you're going to look for something a lot more flexible, I think. And I think that just that adds to the story and makes attracting people into the public sector just that much more, that much more difficult. And New York Times had a story about how the city of New York is facing this problem where the mayor yeah. wants everybody to come back. Unfortunately, the employees don't want to. Yeah. Sharon, you've thought some about infrastructure. Do you think we're uh, on the cusp of an infrastructure boom or is, have we seen everything we're going to get? I think there's the opportunity, as Nick mentioned, there's, um, there's this huge um, need um, at the state and local level. Then there is the, um, the infrastructure monies that is uh, currently available at the federal level. So there is an opportunity to leverage those federal dollars plus what they have in terms of revenues to actually invest. And again, we know when we do investments in infrastructure, we are actually building wealth within the community. There's a lot of um, you know, property, uh, property values increase. There are a lot of businesses that are opening. We're increasing the quality of life. So we're thinking about the quality of our drinking water and, um, and managing our wastewater. So there are a lot of improvements that are positive. And what I would urge state and local governments to think about is there is a way, the cost of borrowing is going up, but it's going up from a very low rate to still what is a low rate. So it's not as expensive as it was pre-2008 when that level, uh, cost of borrowing was much higher. And actually they do have um, within their budgets, they actually have won a lot of reserves, but they also have predictable cash flows coming in from a lot of um, their tax revenues. And they do have the gas tax to back that up and a lot of other 
um, user charges and fees. I think the part that I worry about is when we hear discussions about let's let's lower the gasoline tax, which has been so low for so long, and yet people are driving more and more gas efficient vehicles or hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles. So we're actually getting less revenue from the gasoline tax than what we were before. Yes, um, lower income households are not the ones driving those uh, fuel efficient vehicles. Um, but we get into a period where if we lower those gasoline taxes or we lower our income tax or we lower our sales tax, getting them back up would be very difficult. So it goes back to Tracy's point, what are the headwinds that we're going to see going forward? We are going to see higher employee costs. We're going to see higher pension costs. We're going to see higher production costs because the cost of, uh, of materials is going up, yet we've lowered our taxes because it looks like we are flush now. So I would say hold back and, and, and make the investments in the community. So don't hoard the reserves, make the actual investments in your communities, borrow money, build the infrastructure, repair your schools, repair your roads, improve your water infrastructure, build broadband, all those things that you're getting funding for. Um, and that will grow your economy, but also um, it will demonstrate to your you know, taxpayers and your citizens that you are doing the right things for the right reasons. And you're not doing this in a very temporary basis or a haphazard basis, because um, we are seeing what I consider to be a temporary, um, temporary change in our economy and not a permanent uh, situation. So, Kate, when you look out over the next 12 to 24 months, what's, what are the two or three things on your worry list? Um, two or three. Okay. Um, so let's say. That. I was trying to, <laughs> no, it's fine. You have a worry list? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think it, those of us that work in budget pretty much are worriers. Like, if we're good <laughs> at budget, it means we probably <laughs> are worriers. So, when we say two or three, um, the ones that keep me up at night right now is the um, the shift of moving from go, 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 spin, spin, spin to slowing it down. Um, and like I like we've talked a lot about and what Sharon was just mentioning is the infrastructure work. We've been trying to get that money out the door. Of course, costs of construction is expensive and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little things are coming in. Projects are coming in higher cost than we expected. So we're having to adjust for that, which so far is we're having those conversations. But as we move into how do you slow down, um, that's gonna be pretty hard transition. We haven't had in Oregon really, um, we haven't had a true real recession from budget program budgets for since the 2008, 2009. And for us, it was the um, 11, 2011, 13 biennial budget that really was really difficult for us. Um, and we haven't had that first, I mean, it's been a while. And so those people, the people that have been our new members in the legislature, new administration, um, new agency directors, new program directors, we've had significant turnover since then. And our we haven't dealt with those kind of reductions yet. And how do you put those together? And how do you weigh the new amazing things that we've just moved forward with, with our core programs that have been going on for so long? And how do you have those conversations to make those priorities? Um, and depending on, um, I think we're all seeing this kind of slowdown or whether it's a true recession or not, or when that hits, but seeing that slowdown is going to be kind of just how do you how do you how do you actually move towards implementation of a slowdown without burning through your reserves right away? So it's great that we have our reserves, but without knowing where that bottom of any kind of slowdown looks, we don't want to burn through in the first first time we see that revenue forecast go down. And so we want to or slow, and we want to be able to adjust for that. I think that's the to to really say the thing that's really keeping me up at night. And so if. The governor called you and said, Kate, I've been reading all this talk about recession in the papers. Do you think we're going to get a big dollop of federal aid? What would you tell her? Um, right now, I would say not to the extent that we've seen before. I would hope there'd be something, but I don't know. I think what we're used to in the last two years, I don't see that coming again. And so I think we, we should 
we should level our expectations on that. Thanks. So I want to give uh, Stan and Louise the last word, uh, maybe a minute each. Is anything you want to hit that we haven't hit already or anything you want to reinforce, Stan? And no is an acceptable answer. Well, not directly. I would I would say uh, that I agree with Kate's comment that the big challenge right now is to try and slow down the spending a little bit and transition to a new, more sustainable budget path, in part just because we're in the inflationary environment we're, we're in. And so I understand some states are forced to, to you know, to, to do tax rebates and, and the like with the surplus that they have, but I, I think it's important to limit that as much as possible. Now, I, I agree with Louise that it's, it's not enormous numbers, but, you know, every Every little bit, every little bit helps on some level. Yeah. Louise, yeah, I just want to say that I don't worry too much about this recession that's coming. I mean, obviously, it's possible that'll be really bad, but sort of we're sort of coming down from a very high level and then slowing down. But I do really worry that we're going to overlearn the lesson of this recession for future recessions that are really sort of more, you know, demand driven, bad recessions, not coming from the Fed that says, oh, you don't have to give state and local money, governments money because we gave them so much. Um, and then we're going to be back in. So I, I want to try to make sure that this, this pandemic was a really unusual recession and that we shouldn't not learn the lessons from the past, which is in typical recession, state and local government should be getting aid. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, with that, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then come back. We have a couple of really good papers, uh, one on the financial costs of anti ESG policies in Texas, and another on the information content of municipal financial statements. And then, as I said earlier, we're going to have a couple of informal breakout sessions at 1 45 uh, p.m., and you'll have to join those on Zoom. And there are uh, instructions how to do that on the, on the event page, or if you have a problem, you can use Slido or the Twitter hashtag Muni Finance, and we'll help you do it. Um, so with that, I want to thank uh, uh, Stan and Louise for their papers, and Nick, Kate, and Sharon, and Tracy for their contributions to the conversation. It's always hard when you have so many people in limited time to cover everything, but I think we actually covered a fair amount of territory. So with that, um, stay tuned, and we'll see you all back here at 1230. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.